Hello there and welcome to the English for Rare Film Festival show episode 3 and on the show today uh, we have Diana and Lucy Townsend, mother and daughter creative team and we'll be talking about their feature films Deadly Intent and Scary Crows but before I hand you over to Diana and Lucy here's the trailer to Scary Crows. Hey, have you making Scary Crows this year? You seem to be forgetting Dylan, the rest of us grew up years ago. Aren't those things supposed to be in fields? You're thinking of scarecrows. This is a scary crow. And the difference is... Hey, did you see that? What? That scary crow just moved. Cassie, please. Oh, come on, baby. Whoa! <laughs> I thought I could trust him. Do you still love me? No. Really? Ryan! Oh, shit! Go home, it's not safe! Detain you! <laughs> Listen, you dickhead, we know you're in there! This building's only open during office hours and. Scary crow invasions! No communication, no way out, and a town full of homicidal scary crows. In the circumstances, I think there's only one thing we can do. Piss off, mate. It's not Halloween. So, right. Uh, right. So, I, I'm very happy to be joined today by um, director of Scary Crows, Lucy Townsend, and producer of Scary Crows, Diana Townsend. So, um, to start with, if you'd like to introduce yourselves and how you got into filmmaking. Uh, I'll start with you, Lucy. Right, so my name is Lucy Townsend and I directed um, the feature film Scary Crows. I had a theatrical background and um, trained in acting and everything else and Scary Crows was my first feature length film. I'd done a couple of short films before that but this was my first feature and I naively thought that it would just be a longer version of doing a short film which was not the case. So it turned into a bit of a mammoth and it took us quite a few years to get it finished um, but it is now completed and out on Amazon Prime. Brilliant. Uh, Diana? Uh, well, I've always wanted to be involved in films for, since I was quite small. That was always my dream, but it didn't happen early on. And later on, when Lucy went off to university, it seemed like the ideal opportunity to find me to what I wanted to do. Sorry. Well, it was a university. No, drama school. When Not Lucy appeared, went off, and left me with peace and quiet and time on my hands, um, I decided it was a chance to, don't laugh at me, decided it was a time to do the things I always wanted to do, and that was filmmaking. So... I worked with my brother and husband and we produced a feature length film and I thought that was our learning curve that having got to the <laughs> end of that we would know what we were doing and we then started working on Scary Crows with Lucy and discovered that actually it just meant that we had a whole new set of problems that we hadn't found on the first film to deal with on the second film because filmmaking is really a continual learning curve you never never get to the end of finding something you hadn't expected. I That's prefer to call it a learning cliff. I should be much more positive and um, professional about this. Yeah. But I'd do it again. But no. What... <laughs> <laughs> so what was your inspiration for making this film? Where did Scary Crows come, come from? Where was the, the, the concept of it? Well, we wanted to make something that was a horror film, but a light-hearted comedy horror film more. And so we, we have this wonderful place we live in, in Devon and Dawlish on the south coast, and we thought it would be nice to have something that had a traditional feel to it. So there was an old folk story that we heard a long, long time ago about a village that um, was being invaded by the French right back in the Middle Ages, no, not Middle Ages, Napoleonic era, and that um, some village lady had the bright idea of raiding the fields for scarecrows and putting them up along the cliffs and making them look like soldiers and of course when the French came across they thought the village was defended and sailed away. So we took that loosely, very loosely as inspiration and made our own version of what might happen if the scary crows came to life. So we wow. took it from there. So um, That is the most PC version of that <laughs> retelling I can think of. <laughs> so, so, so Lucy, how did you, how did you, uh, from what I remember, you weren't originally supposed to be the director, was that? Well, 
it was more a case of in the previous feature film, um, I was supposed to be um, taking a larger role in it, but sadly I had to have um, ankle reconstruction surgery at the time, so I wasn't involved in that first film. But I saw a lot and was involved as much as I could be, and once they got to the end of that, I decided that that was it, I was going to drag the next one. So I kind of just, you know, stubborn-headedly insisted that that was going to happen and dragged everything else along because we hadn't even finished Deadly Intent at that point. It hadn't even been released. And I insisted that and we it's started... One thing, I would, one thing I would say to anybody <laughs> else, if you're making a film, for God's sakes, get one finished before you start the next one. That is yeah. <laughs> it's, it's excitement. It's a feature film. <laughs> And yeah, it, it was, in hindsight, I don't think it, Scary Crows would ever have happened if I hadn't been so stubborn. Um, probably. probably not, but yeah. it was. It definitely made things harder having one in post-production and one in pre-production, and we probably should have dedicated more time individually to both of those projects because they deserved better. But that's not how life works, so we made it work, and we made it happen. And... Yes. Now we have two feature films. <laughs> Which is amazing because there's very few independent filmmakers and they've done not only one, they've done, you've done two. And we're planning the third. Yes, Lots we are. Punishment, aren't we? <laughs> Definitely. So, so you're very inspired, inspirational to, so, so what was it like to, uh, Lucy first, to direct this film? Because I understand there were, there were a couple of points where you persevered and you got through those those learning curves and things that life throws at a film set that you we, can't expect. We definitely had a few challenges that were beyond our control, acts of God, um, things like that, that you can plan as much as you want, but you'll never be able to prevent such things from happening. So you've got to be adaptable and you've got to think on your feet and you've got to have enough energy to carry everyone through and as much as a director is you know the figurehead and everything else they are part of a team and you can't do this without an amazing group of people around you it's just you've got to be the one to keep everyone's morale up when everything's going absolutely pear-shaped and be the optimism and be the enthusiasm to know that you can find a way you can figure it out it'll be fine and particularly when things get rough I think directors just have to be naively optimistic sometimes <laughs> and be that stubborn voice that's saying no 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 we will find a way it's going to be fine um maybe you have to have a slightly weird personality type or something but you have to appreciate that the people that believe in you enough that they're going to listen to the insanity and go along with it and i did have an incredibly talented group of people that were keen enough to persevere through the madness so um, there's one occasion when we're very short of time um, we were limited where we were filming because most of the filming was done in or around Dawlish and we had a particular location that we wanted to or we had to use for that morning and we got there everyone was ready to go the VOP arrived with the kit van he literally went to open the back and his key snapped off in the lock of the back of the van so everything was ready we couldn't get the equipment out Lucy was wonderful because she was the one that exuded confidence. She said, It'll don't worry, they will sort it. It'll be fine, just give them a minute. We'll go and get rehearsing. And she kept everybody with her, all happy, all going. <laughs> well, the producing side of it, we were running around the streets trying to find anywhere that was a locksmith and somebody who could get to come and break into the van. And we did Literally manage to break into the van. But Lucy just kept going, nothing was doing, it'll be fine, they'll sort it out, you come and do the positive things and keep going. And that really helps a lot if you've got somebody that just keeps on going whatever. It's and exhausting. Did... <laughs> yes, it is, but it's essential. If you'd started to panic, Ooh. I think everyone would have fallen to pieces. Yeah, and that's the bit where you get your most wonderful blooper reels moments from, is, you know, the silly downtime in between stuff when other things are falling apart and you've got to find ways of keeping people happy. So but, yeah. you, you filmed locally, you filmed in Dawlish. Was it mm. Do sorry, Dawlish for the one? And Mostly the, Dawlish, yeah. The main scenes. What was that minute. like? The the day, I think it's the, the bit of the, the fair scene. Is it the fair scene? Or yeah, the, the village fate. Um, that was actually split over two days. Uh, and um, my God, how we were lucky, so lucky with the weather. I have no idea. But the second day, the wind picked up 
and it nearly blew everything away. <laughs> we had to hold down the marquee. We had to. We actually had, at one point we drove a van inside the tent so that we could strap it down to stop the marquee from blowing away, um, which was really. We fun. had to have umbrellas over all the cast so that the hair yeah. didn't get wet or anything. The moment the rain stopped, we whipped it all away, and it looked as if it was sunshine again. <laughs> Yeah, so the first day was glorious sunshine. The second day was cloud and a week later. Day. But oh god! What, what were people's reactions yeah. to people dressed up as scary crows? Well, we weren't really expecting the local support that we had. So there are a few wonderful blooper bits in the film that, if you didn't know, what you know are there, you wouldn't know that they were serendipitous. So the word got around the town that that's what we were doing and so the second day we had the fate there people just turned up as though it was a real fate and added extra stalls we had people from the local um rotary like, club the rotary club just turned up and just started selling stuff and we also had um people dressing up from the local um fancy dress, fancy dress place so we never asked for those people they just turned up <laughs> Penguin, wasn't it? Penguin yeah. arrived. Penguin and, and an elephant. They an elephant. they were completely That's unexpected, cool. but they just happened to turn up and they signed the forms that we were allowed to use their images and everything else. So fine, great. Yeah. It just kind of grew. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing just grew, and yeah, that's I think one of the wonderful things about working in a smaller area where films aren't just boring and they're not just things that happen. They're oh, they're different. What's going on here? So, so yeah, everyone kind of just felt like, oh, we'll just get involved then, it's okay. It's like, which yeah. is wonderful. Which really helped for us, but so I, I spoke something to, you could plan for. I, I spoke to Simon Cox, who's done Invasion um, Planet Earth, which actually she remembers you from an event <laughs> oh, you yeah. both crowdfunded. And going on to the thing of um, crowdfunding, can you explain to the, the viewers, mm. what's that like? I, I, I get from film my kids it can be quite stressful but the, support, the, the support you the support you get from it what was that like having that extra support and extra financial support to get the film made i mean we still get messages now from people i mean we did we did the crowdfunding what six seven years ago now Must be now, yes. it was a long time ago but we still get messages from people now asking you know more about it what's happening with it now um is it going to be on new platforms and things so once you get a dedicated group of people, you'd be amazed just how dedicated they can be. <laughs> we have had wonderful support from yeah. some of the people that we met through the um, Kickstarter. It was very nerve wracking. Oh, it's a to be honest, it's a horrible experience, particularly because we went for the all or nothing version where mm. if you didn't reach your target, you didn't get anything. And we wouldn't have been able to finish the film without it. And as it got really close to the date, we were so relieved when we went over the amount we needed and what I had no idea about at that point <laughs> was it was actually possible for people to take their um, uh, their deduction back again. That they they saw we'd gone over by a couple of hundred, and a couple of smaller uh, donations were actually taken back at the very last minute. Oh, you don't need and mine anymore. Absolutely <laughs> petrified. But if anyone else had done it, we would have been back and lost the whole lot. But thankfully, nobody else did. <laughs> So, but, um, uh, the nervous tension right to the last minute is awful. I think it adds years to your life. Yeah, it, does, it takes did. years off your life, I mean. <laughs> yeah, negative. So, but yeah. We did um, meet some amazing people, and when we had to do the reshoot, well, that was to do the reshoot, um, again, the help that they gave us in locations and all sorts of things afterwards mm. um, was amazing. So it was, a, it was well worth doing from all sorts of reasons, not just the financial one, but from the meeting new people. But... Definitely not for the faint-hearted. It was horrendous. I hated it, but in hindsight, it was for the best. It was for the best. But definitely. Yeah. Could you briefly explain, Lucy, why you did the crowdfunder? Why you did? So the original ending of Scary Crows, which will never see the light of day, um, <laughs> absolutely never, um, was completely different, and we had problem after problem after problem on the night shoot, which meant that the footage was completely unusable. Um, it wasn't anyone's fault, it was just one of those things. But you can't tell the sun not to rise, and we ran out of time. And the entire ending of the film made no sense. Um, I was having to rewrite on the night scenes that no longer were possible, and it just 
didn't do the film justice to have that ending. So we had run out of money by that point. So it was a do or die Kickstarter, which meant that if we didn't make that target, we would not have a film. So it was extremely high stakes, extremely pressured, and I would hope never ever to have another filmmaker be put in that position again. Um, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. It was awful. <laughs> um, but in hindsight, it was probably the best thing, best outcome for the film because it allowed us to have a whole different ending. It allowed more people to know about it. It made our reach go further. We had a much more um, involved audience before we launched. It was, yeah, there were benefits to it. But it was a horrendous cap in hand scenario. It did so. So, how did you? One of the most interesting parts of your story is your distributor. How did that happen? How it, it's gone everywhere, and you went to Los Angeles, and how did that come about? You know, this is a terrible thing to say, but I can't actually remember. It was Lynn, so <laughs> I do. Oh, yeah, we good. do things by happenstance and luck most of the time, and we decided no, it's to. All planned. It's all planned. Take oh, no it's completely planned. <laughs> um, we submitted a short film into the Fa um, Cannes Film Festival, but we don't speak very good French. So we, what we thought was the competition actually was the Marche, and we ended up with tickets to the short film corner, and we went. This was our very first ever film festival, <laughs> was Cannes. And we decided we'd go back every year. So it was amazing. It was wonderful. It was amazing. That, I would recommend it to everyone. You should definitely, definitely, once it's back up and running again, go to Cannes. And we met all sorts of people. It was the most eye-opening experience for filmmakers I can think of. And we were naive enough to just talk to everybody. And we ended up talking to a sales distributor based in LA. And we built up a relationship with her for a couple of years. We went back to Cannes, we'd catch up with her, talk to her about what kind of projects she likes. And we kind of bespoke wrote our, the first feature film with her in mind as to what kind of things we knew that she could represent. And that's how we ended up with Deadly Intent going through her and then subsequently Scary Grows. So I would recommend applying to lots of film festivals and just turning up. <laughs> that's, that's amazing networking. And um, you actually premiered the, the film in Los Angeles. Um, mm -hmm. How was that experience um, compared from what, you know, there's plenty of filmmakers go out there, there's plenty of many filmmakers can't afford to go out there. What was that experience and like to actually being in the place of, you know, Hollywood? Well, and... to, be quite, to be quite honest, because um, the, the agent we're working with, she's not a big high powered company. She works, she was an independent filmmaker herself and she has now gone into distribution. So she understands the, the whole experience from a filmmaker's point of view, which makes her very good to work with. And um, as we were having a low key release, she recommended that if we had a LA based um, cinema release, which could be quite small, it doesn't have to be uh, right across the States, that can give you the advantage of get you automatically get reviews in things like the LA Times, which gives the film a boost. So she recommended that we had um, a one week release in LA. And we thought, well, this might be the only time in our life we actually have a film of ours actually being premiered in that way, because everything these days is going over to streaming. Um, and we just thought it would be such a shame for it to happen as it's not to have the experience of going and being there. So we decided to make the effort and we took ourselves over to L.A. for, uh, for, the, for the launch. And it was just such an incredible experience. It was a small cinema, but it was on home Sunset Boulevard and it was... We had some of the other um, filmmakers from the same distribution company that we met up with that we'd known a bit through social media. And it was, it was just incredible. Um, I would certainly recommend to anybody that has the opportunity to, to get over there. It's wonderful. And afterwards, Lucy bullied me and made me go around some of the um, studios that well, we had already made appointments with to go and pitch to them. So just yep. the experience of going and pitching in somewhere like Paramount is just wow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so that is that um, so fun. well worth doing if you can 
get the opportunity if you go out to LA do take the opportunity to contact people and it's surprising how they're all friendly they are yes it was amazing so. I still won't forget your face when one of the ladies that was working at the cinema admitted that she'd been following our vlogs and we're like oh I know you guys and that, 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 that your face was like oh my god someone's actually watching them ah! <laughs> yes we actually walked in and she recognized us that was yeah that was probably the highlight of the whole whole experience getting actually. recognized from your vlogs about we're on our way to LA <laughs> So how has it been since um, the, the film going on, on streaming, um, uh, being reviewed and what? Again, you... a learning curve of what not to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a somewhat unfortunate circumstance when we, it sounds perfect. So about a month after we released it on Amazon Prime, our agent managed to get us an exclusivity deal on a cable channel in America. Wow. Um, so they bought the rights um, to for the film run. for three month run to premiere on their cable channel, which was fantastic. Um, and we went for it. And so that meant we had to take it off Amazon Prime um, just after our, all our campaigns of, you know, advertising and everything else for it on Amazon Prime to do this cable deal. And then the cable company went bust. Oh, yeah. So we never got paid. So we never got a penny from that but then of course all of our advertising and all of our build-up and all of our you know getting reviews and everything else completely went as well so we then had to do stuff from scratch on that front so scary crows never really recovered um from being taken off amazon but deadly intent surprisingly still has a lot more following because it, it had a more continuous um support on amazon prime so it's built up a slow growth where a scary crow has just died in the water <laughs> but it's again it, it is in some ways this is the best of times for indie filmmakers because you can make films at a relatively low budget and get them out and get them to their audience but still making it financially viable is very very tough ideally you need a large cast and crew who all have strong social media connections themselves because Definitely. it's Although you can get the film out there, it's the cost of promoting it and getting people to know about it that is still the, the problem for most filmmakers. So um, we're fortunate that having got to the position we're in now, we're looking hopefully on our third film to be in a position to get a bit more funding behind it, hopefully, so as to cover that promotional side as well as the actual creation of the film. But it is a tough route, but there are people that are being successful. And um, certainly, I think you have to take advantage of all the positive things of the world mm. at the moment. That's hard to say when we're in the middle of a lockdown with COVID-19. <laughs> yeah. Even, well, there are still some positive things. And I've been told by contacts in, um, in America that because all the production is cut down, that a lot of the agents are actually prepared. They are reading things and the um, production houses are actually looking for what they're going to be doing once the world is more back to normal. So it's hard sometimes, but I think you have to keep looking for the positives. Well, I mean, you yourself have just released your book. Wow. In a different direction, yes. Different direction, but yeah, you have. First books come out day before yesterday. So there's yeah. always something that you can keep working on, which is good. Mm -hmm. But you're... Um... I mean, you're very inspiring. I mean, Scary, Scary Crows went to Los Angeles. You had a big screen premiere in Exeter. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's yeah, very inspiring. You've done two feature films that I know some bit, you know, it's, they haven't even done the first one yet. And you're thinking about your third. It's, it's very inspiring. And obviously the genres you're going for, actually what, yeah. without giving anything away of your next film, what genre would you say it is? It's a family Christmas film. Oh, wow. Yeah. Completely different. <laughs> now for something completely different. Yes. Yeah. But again, working with kids and a dog at night in the snow. So we don't make it easy for ourselves. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's Ever. That's <laughs> been being creative. So um, just a last question, and thanks very much for joining me today. Um, any advice for filmmakers out there and work and plug away where we can find where Scary Crows is and Deadly and 10 and follow the, or the next story of the next feature. Um, 
so to anyone out there, I'd say don't be afraid to fail because other people have failed far more spectacularly than you will ever get to and still can make it work. So don't be afraid to fail. <laughs> Just try, basically. Um, so Scary Crows can be found on Amazon Prime. Uh, there's lots of other platforms that it's also on, I think still on um, Hulu and I can't remember all the other ones, but it's pretty much on YouTube, nearly every. YouTube, YouTube, iTunes. YouTube, iTunes. Is it on Hulu? Another one. Tubi in America. I don't think Tubi's here yet, but it's coming out very no. soon. Um, this is terrible. I, should I know, right? Be doing um, I'll, I'll, I'll post some links on Google. The video. And Deadly Intent as well. Same. Um, yes. All the VOD platforms, really. Um, yes. But also, yes, do read my mother's darling book, Me, Myself, Me, My Family, and the Poltergeist. Just come out. Sounds like a yes. film. It could well be one day. It a film. I'm, it's a bit too close to home for me to be. <laughs> it's taken me 10 years to get a diploma and write it. <laughs> oh, uh, <sighs> yeah. Oh, uh, brilliant. Well, well, thanks so much for joining me today. And um, as I say, no we problem. post the links on this and share the video around, get more people looking at your films. And uh, yeah, well, well done on two features and look forward to the third. Cheers, John. Thank you. Thank you. How long are you going to be away? Get the job done and then I'll be back. Promise. <laughs> it's as though he blames me for everything. We all here. Can't take it out on Steve. You have to go to bed, James. Oh, I hate you! What is that? It's a dream catcher. But what's it for? To trap evil spirits. Okay.